the NOAM, like we like to call it, or North American East Adobe Analytics User Group kickoff meeting, uh, along with my co-host, Jennifer. Hello. And um, so let's see here. I want to get things officially started. So, um, just a very, very quick introduction here of the two of us. So first off, my name is Jeff Bloomer. I'm the manager of digital analytics here at Kroger. All right, and I'm Jennifer Dungan, and I am the Optimization Manager Analytics for Torstar Corporation. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to turn this over to Kelsey, and she's going to explain to you just how Adobe Analytics user groups work. Sounds great. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelsey Bork. I manage Adobe user groups for Experience Cloud, and we are very excited to kick off this East Coast chapter. I know um, a lot of you have been waiting for an East Coast time zone centric user group for a while, so we're excited to be able to deliver that today. A little bit more about Adobe user groups in general. So the purpose of these groups is really to bring together regional users uh, in person and you know normal times and also virtually to create open and inclusive communities where you guys can network with one another, collectively problem solve and also receive ongoing education. Um, it's really a safe space for you to continue your learning and build up your own personal brand as an analytics user. We do have a couple of just housekeeping rules and code of conduct uh, to make sure that we are keeping this a safe space, as I mentioned. So um, just making sure that it's user focused, no selling or self promotion and pitching. We don't want you guys to be contacting people outside of the user group without their consent, which I'm sure you can um, you know, appreciate. And then also, um, if you hear some interesting use cases shared, make sure that you reach out to them, uh, to the presenters, if you want to dive a little bit deeper or share out their information with other people beyond the user group. So a little bit about our program goals in general, um, as I mentioned, the first goal and one that is extremely important is to help you expand your network of people that you can go to for tips and tricks. Um, within the analytics community. With that comes having your toughest questions answered. You know, uh, support tickets are always great and always there, but this is also an additional resource for you to get more information and answers when you need it. A third goal is always a, a fun one, and that is swag. As you can see, Jen and Jeff both are rocking some Adobe swag. They have their, their flags in the background as well. Um, and we love to kind of congratulate you guys and reward you for joining these groups. So um, as a thank you, today we'll be doing a raffle based on the attendance list, and we'll be sending out an Amazon e-gift card for $25 to one lucky winner. So I'll be emailing you after the user group to let you know that you have won. Um, and then lastly, increase your own personal brand. So if you are interested in sharing um, your particular use case or your expertise with the community, please feel free to reach out to us, to Jeff, Jen, and myself. We're always looking for speakers at these user groups, and we want to give you the opportunity to increase your personal brand. And a lot of you have reached out and asked about other user groups with, within Experience Cloud. So I am happy to say that we are committed to creating accessible and inclusive customer led user groups across Experience Cloud. So while we as Adobe employees love to participate in these groups, we really like to let um, the users drive the agendas and kind of the formation of these chapters. So um, coming soon, we're launching experience manager user groups as well as commerce and work front. And a couple upcoming opportunities for you as user group members that we'd like to share today. First is Experience Makers Live, which is happening uh, August 31st through September 1st. And this is a free virtual event. So it's there to give you the tech and insights you need to be ready when the world starts to reopen. Um, there's going to be keynotes and uh, sessions for you to connect with other users and industry specific sessions to grow your network. So make sure to check that out. And then lastly, um, we are hosting another Experience Makers Skill Exchange event on September 14th. And this is a three hour digital event all about Adobe Analytics. 
And we are looking for a rock star customer speaker to share an interesting tip or trick. And we'll get that recorded um, and share out as kind of like a commercial snippet at the skill exchange. So if you're interested in that, I've provided Shay Cybulski, who's the program lead, her email information there. All right, and if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me at any time. I've included my email address here and it'll be in we'll send out after the user group meeting, but back over to you, Jeff. All righty, well, thank you. Uh, just some additional information we wanted to go ahead and share here. First off, this is uh, both uh, my information and uh, Jennifer's just out on uh, both LinkedIn and then on Slack. And then just an additional, uh, you know, message here. Um, you know, our group is, you know, being brand new. First off, um, we, you know, we're, we're bringing you some presentations today, but moving forward, um, you know, we really need presenters to uh, come to us as well, because uh, we're really looking for people within the user group to join us. This is an open forum. So we're really looking, looking for your talent to come in and, and, uh, and help share what you know about Adobe Analytics. That's what the user groups are for. And then the other thing that we're also looking for is we're looking for another person to possibly help us lead our group. We're we're two right now, but you know, you know, you know how things work. Uh, sometimes a person needs to be gone, or maybe it just happens to be that we're just needing some fresh ideas. So um, we're also looking for the possibility of having somebody uh, you know join us as another leader here within the East Group. Now. Now that, we, now that we've uh, got your attention, uh, what I want to do here is I want to take you out um, to this page here, and I can actually put this into the chat as well. Uh, if you want, if you need the link, uh, you can also scan this with your phone. Uh, let me get back out to the chat here and post this if you want to join in with our with our poll. And I'll give you just a second or so to join us out here on the poll. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and throw up our first question here. So first thing that we want to know about everybody that's in, uh, joined us today. So how long have you been using Adobe Analytics? Ah, very good. Okay. And all right. And, and let's see. So what is your experience level with campaign tracking? Oh, very good. <laughs> I'm liking these answers here. <laughs> I mean, that's helped me. Yeah, we got about 5%, 4 or 5%. We're rock stair, but it's still here. Okay, awesome. That's great. Okay. Uh, so the next question is then from that. Um, so let's got to get, get it to jump here. Whoop. Technical but, difficulties. Technical, yes, they always happen. WebSocket connection closed. I don't know why it decides to do that. Just give me a second. Naturally. So, I mean, okay, while we're waiting here, uh, I, I should give just a little bit of credit here because um, Frederick, uh, Frederick Werner, uh, Werner used this same uh, tool during his during his launch. And so we're trying to emulate some of that same interest here. Let's see if we can, there we go. So now if I can get to the next one, uh, let's see, pause. Let me stop it again and then start and see if I can get it to refresh and go again. Of course, this is how things always work. Go ahead and see if I can't get it to show where we actually are. All right, let's see if I can. There we go. Next. 
Oh. All right. There we go. Yeah. What, there we go. What is your experience level with classifications? Oh, and um, very good. Maybe everyone else. Oh, no, there it comes about. So I was starting to wonder. Uh, there we go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you were holding off just for a second there. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I like the huh. <laughs> All right. I'm loving it. This is good. Oh, all right. And we're getting, uh, so, so what kinds of content would you like to see in future events here? Um, so, and we, we borrowed this question, like I said, lovingly from, from Frederick. So looks like we've gotten some responses already. People are filtering in here. So tips and tricks, data analytics strategy, no surprises there. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, what day of the week would be the best for all of you? Hmm. All right, weekend peoples. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, not surprising. Wednesdays uh, very popular to do these kinds of things. Middle of the week work, works out quite well. All right. And then, so just which Adobe Analytics evangelist are you guys excited to see today? Just got to ask. <laughs> ooh, ooh, we've got like um some <laughs> I was gonna say the off was when it was was starting to pick up some steam there for a minute. <laughs> um Eric. <laughs> That's great. Okay, well we thank everybody for your responses. Oh, looks like we just hit a hit a tie there. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well. Eric versus Eric. Come on. Yeah. Right. <laughs> there we go. Well, uh, I appreciate all of your uh, all of your responses, uh, Jen and I. Jen and I, we appreciate all of your responses. So what we're going to do is we're going to move right into the uh, the first presentation of the day. Uh, the uh, and so we were asking you a little bit earlier about campaign tracking. And so the reason for that is because that's what I'm going to be talking about here. So I introduced myself just a little bit earlier. So again, my name is Jeff Bloomer. I grew up in the St. Louis metro area of Southern Illinois where my family owned small chain of movie theaters. So throughout like most of my youth and teen years and as a result of growing up in the entertainment industry, you know, I kind of developed a very healthy interest in both movies and comic books. And so while many of you knew, uh, many who like knew me both then and now might consider me like a you know, big Star Wars fan, my true passion has always been centered around the heroic character of Superman. So, uh, and collecting comic books, particularly during the mid to late eighties. Of course, these days, I also enjoy spending plenty of time with my family, you know, whether it's an amusement park or out hiking, as you can see me here with my wife, Deanne. Well, why Superman, you ask? Well, that answer is fairly simple. So um, as I previously mentioned, my family owned a small chain of movie theaters until the larger companies moved into the area in the 80s. And my dad uh, was the general manager. And in, in the latter part of 1979, uh, one of his managers actually had to take a leave of absence, and my dad decided to reward me, um, his eight-year-old son at the time. Uh, another spoiler about my age. I think I was talking about that earlier. Anyway, um, for finished, you know, so he was re report, rewarding me for like finishing my homework uh, by taking me to the uh, the weekend matinees to watch Superman uh, while he ran the theater. So learning to thread the projectors with my dad was also a plus, but. At one point, I probably knew Christopher Reeve's line better than he did. So 
uh, when I couldn't watch the movie anymore, I had developed, you know, like enough of an addiction, uh, you know, that I started seeking out the old syndication, syndicated like reruns on TV. And of course, my mother couldn't have been happier uh, since the old George Reeves show was like a favorite of hers and when she was young. So, but who could blame her? I mean, that show was, you know, very iconic, especially with that introduction. And I think I might have even used it once or twice out there as an intro on social media, you know, just for fun. Well, anyway, all kids have to become adults. And in 2013, this comic book, you know, comic book and movie kid eventually went to work for the largest grocery retailer in the United States, which is where I also had the honor of working on the Adobe Analytics implementation for their e-com solution, ClickList and which we have now all come to simply call Kroger Pickup. Of course, that labor of love could not have been accomplished without the collaboration of a large team of Kroger developers and other valuable partners. In fact, I was the senior implementation specialist for Kroger Digital from 2014 until I was promoted to the manager of digital analytics at Kroger Personal Finance in January 2019. KPF's primary lines of business are represented by gift cards, credit cards by partnering with U.S. Bank, and then money services. And the way that we go to business and drive value is by partnering with third-party vendors through what's called a hub-and-spoke model. Now, over the course of this job, I've encountered and learned like many important things, but one particular topic, which I already alluded to, has carried significant value during that time, uh, and that, that's been campaign tracking. So therefore, when I'm done speaking with you today, my goal is to hopefully have a measurable impact on your job as both an analyst and as a manager of data. So that brings us to the top of the topic of our discussion. What is campaign tracking? Well, campaign tracking in its most basic form identifies how your customers discover your site. Think about how we already track what our customers do within our websites and mobile apps. So it really shouldn't take a great leap for us also to have the desire to understand how they arrive there as well. So if I borrowed an example using like my favorite superhero, um, how was Superman transported to Earth? Now, depending on, on your age and what movies you've seen or the comics you've read, I probably just started like, you know, a really healthy debate. Yes, we would probably use the term rocket to determine the, the you know, that form of projectile that was used to escape Krypton, but exactly what form did that rocket take? Was it, uh, you know, like the type of, you know, right out of the Flash Gordon movie, that old fashioned kind? Uh, was it something more like, uh, you know, that organic thing that we've seen in the movies and TV shows? Or maybe it looked like, um, you know, like that giant snow cone, you know, with crystal spikes sticking out of it, slowly melting as it entered the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> um, you might be saying, who cares? They send him to Earth in a rocket, move on. But remember, these kinds of details you know, they become really important, you know, particularly when you, know, you were starting to talk about, you know, um, these things, you know, with campaign tracking, things like channel, source, and medium, for example. You know, in fact, you know, that's kind of like a nice little mental exercise just to get yourself going. You know, for a campaign, you know, what, what would you propose to use for values like channel, source, and medium for the campaign? I mean, you know, there's no right answer. You know, I mean, like, what would you propose, you know, for instance? I mean, you can go ahead and put it in the chat box, but you know, we can talk about that a little bit later if you want. So, if we... Now that we've got the, you know, the, the juice is flowing a little bit, what, what do campaign codes even look like? Um, if you think about it, campaign tracking codes are just as different and unique as the comic book heroes that their costumes, cinematic universes, and the studios that they belong to, right? I mean, you know the drill. Um, with all the different incarnations from movie to movie, TV show, from decade to decade, um, or even from comic to comic, things can get really complicated really fast. So just think about the differences in campaign tracking codes that you can encounter between like two different platforms. Think about it. G Google uses UTM parameters, uh, which can even be used inside Adobe Analytics, but then we typically use what's called a CID, uh, short for campaign ID, right out of the box. Or if, 
if you want to get more fancy, we can set up more parameters and then configure Adobe Analytics to simply watch for those too. And then do we ever start watching the campaign tracking code start rolling in? And it's every version of a comic book character that you can possibly imagine. I mean, here's one parallel that you can consider where Warner decided to poke a little fun at their differences during their crisis crossover series on the CW. So Brandon Routh, who played Superman in the movies, reprised his character again on the show alongside Tyler Hoechlin, okay? So who re represented the Superman of that universe. Now, Tom Welling represented yet a third incarnation of Superman, Clark Kent, from the Smallville universe, uh, who decided to give up his, give, you know, give up his powers. Small, small spoiler, yeah. Okay, then Grant Gustin, and Ezra Miller shared the screen for a brief time, uh, uh, you know, brief comedic flash encounter. While there were other parts of the show, when Grant also shared the screen with John Wesley Shipp, he was the Flash from the 90s TV series. In fact, they took the opportunity to present all matter of many incarnations of our favorite superheroes during this six-part crossover series that we saw all kinds of things we didn't expect. Thankfully, though. They had the presence of mind to leave out certain elements. Now, we've all seen the same thing with campaign tracking codes within our own companies. I mean, just these four campaign codes here demonstrated enough disparity, you know, to make one's mind hurt. Now, <laughs> imagine hundreds of thousands of campaign tracking codes coming in through an organization, yet no discipline in their creation on the front end. Yeah, in no time flat, You've got an end product, much like Zack Snyder's original Justice League from 2019, basically an oversized Charlie Foxtrot comprised of absolute gobbledygook, probably stitched together by an unwitting third party. That would only serve to further and frustrate and confuse you. Whew, okay. So you're probably thinking, if it's that complicated, why should I even bother to care about campaign tracking codes or even campaign tracking in general? Good question. So let me ask you this. In the comic book world, what do you think that each of these people care about? The almighty dollar. In fact, how many storylines can you remember where either they or any of the other main characters have been required to follow the money? And much like those characters, it, is it not our job to follow our customers and what they do on our websites? Naturally, smart businesses also want to know how a customer got there. Why? So that we can market to them better. We want them to come back and buy more stuff. So before we get caught up in what a campaign tracking code should contain, let's get back to the basics real quick. When I think of campaign tracking and configuration, I immediately start to think of Superman's Fortress of Solitude and the thought process it must have taken his father, jor to make sure everything came out all right when he needed it. Now, we don't have to be nearly that complicated starting out, but if we're going to have any kind of meaningful reporting in the future, what we at least need to plan, uh, well, we need to at least plan some sort of rudimentary details. So keeping that in mind when we talk about campaign tracking ultimately what we're affecting is our marketing channels if we were super patient and careful like Jarrell, then maybe we could even imagine you know like perfectly configured channels like crystalline tubes perfectly arrayed in the fortress of solitude but you know realistically we should start you know things out just a little bit simpler in fact Adobe Analytics makes it easier by providing basic marketing channels for us right out of the back, that right out of the box. So you got paid search, natural search, email, social networks, affiliate, and then display ads. The way that we affect these marketing channels depends on how we configure the processing rules behind the scenes to manage the campaign tracking codes we send to our platforms. It is important to note that not all marketing channels are necessarily controlled by campaign tracking codes. However, more than likely, if not, uh, if not all, campaigns, uh, campaign tracking codes will affect your marketing channels if managed correctly. So um, you remember the conversation we had earlier about the different incarnations of a character that we saw in a TV show. 
naturally you, you have, you know, different directors, storytellers and producers who all come along and they all want to put their own spin on the story. Right. Okay. I mean, let's talk about the different versions we've had to endure with, you know, just one logo. If you think about it, it's not all that different in the marketing world, you know, or, or in general either. I mean, everyone has their own little twist that they want to put on their campaign tracking code. And then all of a sudden you've got a few dozen, well, try a hundred, uh, different incarnations of campaign tracking codes floating out around there that no one can decipher. I mean, worse yet, there's no accountability because no one is truly sure who created it. Now it's up to an analyst to take all these disparate campaign tracking codes and attempt to create classifications for the rest of us to understand what everything means. Um, so the only way that we can manage all this complexity, um, honestly, is by establishing what we call standards, folks. So if you're going to have a clean, uh, if you're going to have clean marketing channels and you want to keep your classification rules to a minimum, then the work that you do up front will reduce your vulnerabilities later. And trust me, most everyone has some kind of help starting out. If you don't know where to start, you might take a look at something like Google's campaign URL builder, you know, something like that to get your creative juices going. But the point is your campaign tracking codes need to have some components that help you understand some or all of these following items. Channel. Okay. So this sounds, you know, it's just, just like it sounds, this is the marketing channel, your email display, social media, direct mail, I think you get the idea there. Next is source. This is your referrer, okay? So this can be anything that you, you know, like in for uh, like a source of funding for your campaign as well. Think of like uh, Google My Business newsletter or now, and I've even seen people do where they just say it's like a promotion or if it's paid or even like earned social grants. So you can get a little bit more generic there. Medium. So how was the message actually delivered? So did it come through a single subject email? Uh, was it a banner ad, Facebook, Twitter? Okay, so you should get the gist. Next is your campaign name. Keep it short and sweet, and I do mean short and sweet. Content, okay, now this is one of the first two optional flags and you can indicate in, you know, like different sections of an email that users are interacting with. And here's what's really important. I'm going to tell you right now. You're already in, you're already tracking what people are doing on your websites. You want to know what they're doing. If they're you know clicking on an e spot or a button or anything like that. Same thing goes with your emails. If you've got different sections in your emails, if you've got a banner or a button, same thing. Make sure that you're including in that the banner or button that they're clicking on, so that you know what's actually driving people from your emails term. So this is your second optional flag. And this can be used for like, you know, paid search clues, you know, to include key terms and things like that. Of course, you do always have the option to bring like additional elements to the team. Well, you know what I mean? The, the point is, it's one team, folks, one team. So you don't get, get to keep switching, you know, out different incarnations of each, you know, team member, this is your hall of justice. And this is where you get to choose the members and determine what the team looks like and then lock it in. And then spread the word and build your documentation. I, I can't emphasize this enough. You need to centralize it. In fact, there are tools out there to help you maintain your standards. Of course, finding the right tool to democratize your standards will require a little work. So in the interest of time today, I'm going to refer you to my full presentation from July 27th, which is sitting out there on the user groups YouTube channel. But suffice it to say, regardless of the solution you put in place or how much documentation you have backing up your processes and, and standards, you may also find it valuable to have the support of an executive sponsor and or leadership to ensure you know, that your, you know, that your program remains on track. Remember, it's all about communication. Now, now that you're on the path to 
cleaning up your campaigns, and perhaps your marketing channels, I just have one more advice, uh, piece of advice for you, okay? Don't cross your streams. That would be bad. So what am I talking about? Well, yeah, you're probably still trying to get over the fact that I just jumped away from the DC universe, but uh, remember I did grow up in the movie theater you know, industry. So I, I guess you could say that the world of movie trivia is like kind of my oyster here. Um, so, and you know what? Going to the movie theater is actually a great way to demonstrate exactly you know, what I wanna talk about. Internal versus external campaign tracking codes. Let's use two QR codes as a quick example. Everything that we've covered up until now has addressed what we would traditionally consider an external campaign tracking code. But we, uh, we have internal sources that are just as important. And if we wanna keep everything clean, um, consider this kind of a scenario. Your movie theater uh, has any number of promotions running in both print and digital form all the time. So for example, say that you have a current $5 special coupon for popcorn and soda in the local paper. And everyone agrees that this qualifies as, as like a traditional external campaign, right? Okay. So here is a different scenario. You manage to get to the theater at a good hour like before the movie started and they let you in as the doors open. You're really happy because you got your choice of any seat in the theater and you're all set to just relax, you know, wait for the movie to start and casually watch the movie trailers, you know, while you check your Instagram feed. And then this ad flashes up on the screen. So let's take a look at it. What's going on here? What's, what's going to happen? Well, uh, some of the people in the theater are going to scan it, right? Well, after they do that, they're going to get something like this on their phone. And then they're going to walk out to the concession stand to show the person behind the counter, get their snacks, and most importantly, get their discount. So what kind of a campaign is this one? That's right. It's an internal campaign. So does anyone have any questions about the difference? And if you do, we'll go ahead and put, put them off just a little bit here until the end of this presentation. So moving forward here just a little bit. So now that we've established what an internal campaign is, let's just talk through just some very, you know, very simple technical specs for a minute. So what we're looking at here, most everybody, um, you said that there were a lot of people that said that they were, you know, either rock stars or that they understood campaign tracking pretty well. Well, the campaign tracking code, the, the default one that, that's available, everybody should know that it's available through EVAR 30. Uh, I'm sorry, EVAR0. Boy, did I just misspeak. Sorry. EVAR0. <laughs> uh, it uh, typically expires after 30 days, but you can change that. Then, uh, you know, you can usually, um, this usually will affect your marketing channels, but remember that caveat that I said before. You still have to set that up. And then this is what it looks like or can look like uh, in your query string. You do have the ability to actually customize what it looks like in your, cam in your query string as well. Second, the internal campaign tracking codes. This does require its own EVAR, and in fact, you can even use more than one. You can change up the expiration. Um, you know, I've known people to do it from one day to you know three days, even a week. Just kind of depends on what your needs are. But here's what's really cool, and this is why you would want to use an internal campaign code on things because it operates outside of your marketing channels, which is fantastic. So you, you don't have to affect your marketing channels by using an internal campaign. Again, uh, this is what it can look like inside your query string. And uh, now you can change that up just as well to fit your needs. Now, in addition to these, uh, everything that I've mentioned so far, you can also use classifications to flesh out your campaign codes. And Jen's going to actually talk about this kind of stuff a little bit later. So... Now it's time for you to like basically go out there and pick your team for internal campaign tracking codes. And you know what, from here, you've got a little bit more free reign, but it will also give you fair warning. Keep it clean because it's still going to be a bumpy ride. So just like external campaign tracking codes, you've got all the same trappings and just as many opportunities for everything to get just as mess messy and you know just as quickly. So make sure that you start out with a plan. I can't emphasize that enough. 
uh, you will have many uh, important questions you need to answer before moving forward. And as you can see from the choices you know, right here before you, you are not confined to just one universe of solutions. So my next slide gives you some places to start, including a link to a blog article. It's written by, you know, not too long ago by one of our current Adobe champions. Uh, you might know him, his name's Adam Greco. Uh, however, at this point, we can take, um, you know, maybe one or two questions now, but in the interest of time, we'd like to go ahead and keep most of our Q&A toward the end of the session today. So please make sure to put your questions into the chat box so that we can address them at that time. And I'm gonna thank you. I'm gonna move on to this next slide here just to give you a little bit uh, time to take a look at it. These are some places to start. Later on, we're going to actually post this so that you have the ability to actually use it. And that is my presentation, folks. Good job, Jeff. So I need to stop sharing my screen. There we go. Everybody good so far? All right. All right. I'm going to go ahead. So, hey, looks like you're getting lots of kudos. So, following up uh, Jeff's presentation, uh, and one of the questions that came through was how do you fix your data if it's gone through wrong? Well, I mean, ideally, it's always you want the correct information, but there are ways of, of handling this. So first off, um, I'll just do a quick introduction of, of myself. Uh, I am definitely not as interesting as Jeff, um, so I apologize. Uh, but uh, I have been working with um, Adobe for a very, very long time, starting as a developer from the QA perspective, and now just as a as in charge of the analytics department. So. I've, I've hit the, the gambit on pretty much every part of the life cycle. So classifications, there are actually numerous applications that you can use for your classifications, such as uh, mapping new data to what's been captured um, beyond. So extending your data, uh, you can parse uh, the structure, structured data into smaller extracted portions, uh, um, and this allows you to uh, capture multiple pieces of information in a single proper EVAR, or uh, if you're using the uh, campaign ID that's Adobe, which is all in one, you can use this to parse it out. Uh, you can parse structured data into a more readable variation. So you can send little short forms of things, but then change it into something that's more readable for uh, your, your end users. Uh, you can map data variations to um, a single value for easier reporting. So if team A wants format uh, X and team B wants format Y, you can facilitate that through classifications rather than taking up two entire props or EVARs to pass the data in their preferred formatting. And there's lots of other applications. I mean, we're only going to be able to touch the surface on it today. So today I'm going to use avatar as our example, um, because just like an avatar, the humans that are, are being turned into these Navi hybrids, they're not actually changing. They're safe and sound back at the bunker. What's happening is they are applying classifications onto them and extending what they become. It's not, uh, they're, they're all safe and sound. The humans are untouched. Your data, your raw data is completely untouched as well. It's all there, it's as it's recorded, so you don't have to worry about actually breaking stuff. Um, and if something doesn't work, you can go back and redo it because classifications are great that way. They are uh, non-persistent. All right, so before we begin, um, we're gonna have to, everything starts from the same starting point. In order to use classifications, you must first decide what your variables are going to have classifications applied to them and what those classifications will actually be. Uh, so just like in this example where you can actually set up your structure and set up your name, this one is showing uh, creative elements, campaigns, channel, site, whatever you need. Um, 
you'll find classifications under your traffic elements, under your conversion uh, attributes, under your marketing channels. There's classifications under many different uh, parameters in the Adobe system. So you just need to look for which one you actually are trying to achieve. So let's get started. We're gonna apply some characteristics to Jake. Uh, so in this case, we're gonna maybe make his skin color blue, uh, make him 10 feet tall, make him athletic, and well, we're gonna make him so he can breathe the poisonous atmosphere. These are like the attributes that we're going to apply to extend our data. So we're gonna get started turning this guy into, oh, wait a second. And this guy. <laughs> but I mean, who am I kidding? Maybe you want to turn him into that first guy. Or maybe you want to turn him into all of these people. You know, that's the beauty of classifications. You can create what you need and extend as much as you want if you want to get into the, the depths. All right. So simplified steps for using the classification importer. Uh, you want to set up the classifications you're going to need, obviously. You're going to download the template for the variable you're going to import data for. Populate the data mappings, depending on the size. You might need to get support from a DBA to help map your data uh, to your product. And then you can import the file into Adobe for specific variables. Now, that's going to result in a big file that looks like this, which looks quite overwhelming. Uh, and you're probably going, oh my God, I don't want to get into that. Well, I, I, I kind of agree for you in some cases. This type of method with the classification importer is something that you only really want to get into if you can, if your data is kind of stable or you've got the support that you need to, to keep massive amounts like this up to date. Um, and uh, so that would be something like using your, your uh, SKUs for a product. But there's also something called Rule Builder, and this allows you a li little bit more flexibility to create rules on the fly. Um, so it actually has an interface that looks like this, and you can actually build rules and test out data and make modifications, little modifications on the fly. And there are four ways of building out rules, starts with, ends with, contains and regular expressions. And the first three are pretty self-explanatory, but regular expressions are a little bit more complicated. And what Adobe provides you with is this nice little regular expression builder. They've got some samples of regular expressions uh, and it allows you to put in a sing sim single sample key. So when you build your regular expression, you can actually see how it's going to come out. Are you using groups? Where do those groups break out? What are your match results? And if it fails outright. Now this tool is, is great, but sometimes I like to actually uh, do this at a bigger level, looking at more data when I'm trying to build out my regex. Uh, so I like uh, using um, regextester.com. There's other tools out there. I, um, I believe, uh, Jeff, you said, um, the other one was Rubik, um, what was it? R Rubix or? Rubular, sorry. Rubular, Rubular, okay. Rubular, yes. And they all sort of facilitate the same sort of thing, but you can actually pass in multiple values and see how your regex is actually building out um, and if it's building out the way you need it to. So here I've, I've set up a sample. Um, I've put in two regular expressions. The rules in your rule builder are order specific. It will run the first rule, then the second rule, then the third rule. So you need to make sure that you don't have overlaps because um, if you have overlaps, the last match will, will be the one that, that occurs. Now you'll notice here that I'm actually targeting two different classification sets, campaign type, and ID. Um, so even though I'm using the same regular expression, I'm doing different things with them and targeting a different classification. So there's no actual problem. There's no overlap. And when I run the tests against a larger set of data, there is a, a test 
after you've built it to, to see what's happening. You can put in multiple sample keys at this point and it will actually show you all the, the sample keys, the rules that have been tested and where things are unmatched. So you can see in this sample, my first three matched both the ID and the campaign type and my last two are unmatched because of the way I built my rule. Now, maybe that's what I expect. Maybe I'm only looking for affiliate data. Um, and by the way, I think I missed that. Affiliate was a hard coded value based on the AFF and the, the ID was actually extracted um, based on the regex group. And so if this is what you're expecting, you're good to go. But maybe I actually said, oh, no, I, I want to deal with the, the other two that are unmatched. So I can go back in and I can build out more regular expressions. Um, so in the case of my affiliate rule, I left it exactly the same because I'm specifically looking for AFF. For my ID, I've made it now more generic, looking for any value followed by a uh, a, a digit, um, a, a multi-character uh, uh, digit to extract out to the ID. And then I've created the rule for the DF or the SM to map into data feed or social media. And when I test the rules again, now I see that everything matches and I'm good to go. And just remember, yep, go ahead. Uh, just remember when you're doing these guys, you want to make sure that you have your rules in order because these things execute in order. They do, and, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Be very, very careful when you're you're doing multiple rules that you don't, that if you want something to override something else, put it farther down the list. Another way to use your classifications is um, that I like to use, and that's to actually pass multiple pieces of data into a single variable, um, such as your CID, or in this case, I'm doing kind of some search variables rather than trying to pass in four different props for page number and number of results and results per page and sort order. I've passed them all in one in a very specific order and created rules around them. And then I can even test what happens if I only get a page number. What happens if I get zeros? What happens if I get no value at all, but just my, my delimiters of pipe? So I can see how the rules are going to fall out and whether or not I'm happy with this. Now, one thing, and, and Eric, please, please listen, and I'm sure uh, Jeff will back me up on this, zeros. Numeric zeros yes. do not parse into <laughs> a number. They will disappear. Uh, so if you want zero to show up as a zero, there are two little hacks you can use. One is to actually replace zeros with the word zero. Yuck. Uh, or, yeah, uh, yuck, or uh, what I do is I put zero dot. So, so it's like zero point nothing, but it still sort of works. Um, at least then it comes, comes through kind of looking like a numeric number. Uh, but those are the little tricks that you're going to have to figure out until Adobe fixes the zero problem. But if you are happy with your results, then all good. In my case, this is good. If I don't have a page size, I don't need it to pass into the classification. If I don't have a total number of results, I don't need it to pass into a classification. And in the case of, um, you know, like sort order, I could, you know, pass through unknown or um, pass through nothing. The sky's the limit. You do what works for you. Um, and you can always create into your regex rules if you're missing something to populate a default value. And uh, but after you've, you've created your reg regular expression rules or any report builder, I should say, uh, it should be noted that when you make rule changes, um, you can process new rules up to a maximum of six months. So what this means is after you've, you've, built out your, your classification rules, running it um, one month, we'll actually look back in time one month and apply all your rules and classifications to a full month of data or up to six months of data. So if you start noticing stuff coming in wrong and you use classifications to fix it, it will not just start from the point you create your rule but it can actually go backwards in time so that your last six months of data can actually be processed and read um, in a more appropriate fashion. 
Uh, but you should know that these uh, the rules only run every four hours. So if you need to see live data, uh, it's not a great solution for it. Um, but if you're just looking at at doing analysis uh, for last week or yesterday or last month, then, then it's fine. Uh, and now uh, using classifications to consolidate variations. So uh, this is uh, what came up with marketing channels. What happens if? Well, I'm sure like many of you, you've seen this in your classifications or your marketing channel, sorry. <laughs> I, I don't even wanna to touch some of those. I don't know what Facebook comma Twitter is, but I don't think it makes any sense to me. Um, <laughs> But I'm sure this is the kind of stuff that you've also seen in your reports. And nobody likes dealing with this. So one thing that you can do is if you've discovered this in your data is to create classifications based on rules. Um, so pros and cons of using classifications, pros. They work retroactively. So you can go back and fix stuff that did not come through as you expected. You can redo your classifications if what you have built doesn't actually work. You might build something, say, this is amazing, put it into production, start looking at the data and go, oops, that's not what I meant. I need to redo this. No problem. You can redo it and reprocess it to your heart's content. Um, you can conserve props and EVAR. So if you're running out, you can start consolidating like things together and parsing them out thereby extending what you have available to you. You can turn one value into many. So you can take one value and map it to X or Y or Z for your different people into their own classification without actually worrying about your raw data. Uh, and there's no need to retag or make code changes to your site. It's all within the, the, um, the reporting capabilities. It's mapped after the fact. So you can, you can play around with it and, and test stuff out. Cons, they work retroactively. And you're probably going, well, wait, wait, hang on. The problem with retroactivity is if you are relying on seeing how things change over time and trend or what was the value last month versus the value this month, classifications aren't going to work so well because they're going to overwrite that that data when they they're doing their lookbacks so if you need to actually see how differences are affecting you it's actually not a good thing to use classifications for that uh, they can't be used in raw data feeds so if any of you are using raw data feeds um, then this is this is going to be a problem because these are processed data they do not go out in raw data they do go out in uh, your data warehouse. They do go out through um, the API calls, like the, the Adobe API, just not in your raw data feeds. It's, it's part of that same problem with, uh, it's not good for live data, they're processed after the fact. Um, they can't be used in pathing reports. Pathing reports, again, rely on the raw data to, to create the associations and, and pathing through your site. Um, they can be a big time investment. So depending on, <laughs> yeah, I can hear Jeff laughing. Depending on how bad your data is, you may go, yes, I can fix my marketing channels, but at what cost? You could end up spending your life tweaking your rules. Um, and they process every four hours. So again, if you need the data now, it may not be the best solution. Um, so I've also posted some links for, for information on, on classifications, some from Adobe, some from well-known bloggers, um, even one about how to stack your classification rule builder rules, um, because we don't want people accidentally overriding what they expect to come out. Um, and then I also posted the tools to uh, the one I like, Regex Tester, or the one that uh, Jeff had recommended um, or through came from Adobe, uh, Rubular. And again, we'll post these um, at uh, into the YouTube channel, and so you can actually get those at that point. Now, um, Jeff, are we going to go into questions and answers or go straight into Eric? 
We'll go ahead and go ahead and allow Eric to join us, and then we'll go ahead and uh, put the QA at the end so that we can do all the the questions at once. Okay. Well, then I will introduce our surprise presentation by Eric Matisoff. Yay! Oh boy! <laughs> <laughs> Yikes! We figured you'd either appreciate that or be horrified. We wanted yeah, to well, you know what? When I made that in Photoshop, I was having I didn't expect it would it would uh quite take off the way that it has. So uh, <laughs> I'm glad it exists. But you know, you can see I'm working on on that mustache again right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and let you take uh ownership. Yes, please stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, awesome. First of all, thank you to Jeff and thank you to Jennifer, both of you, like really, really excellent content. Really appreciate you both putting in the time and focusing in on, on movies of which I'm a, a huge fan myself. Um, though, uh, Jeff, did you say your parents owned a theater chain, a local theater chain in St. Louis? Yes. This was in uh, Southern Illinois. It was uh, Bloomer Amusement wow. Company. It was in, uh, yes. Yep. Sure did. Super cool. Yeah, that cool. sounds that sounds like fun. And uh, Jennifer, I, I did not expect to see Mr. Meeseeks in your your presentation today, so I'm a, uh, I was glad to see that as well. Uh, well, I'm purple, not blue, but does it count? Can yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> For sure, it counts. Um, <laughs> awesome. So. Um, let me uh, go ahead and share some fun content for a little bit. And um, we actually had a request coincidentally, like literally the day that the group of us decided what kind of content to share that was about this topic. So it's kind of a win-win if you ask me. Yes. Let me um, make sure that I know how to share my screen and you should see it. Awesome. Looks good. Cool. Um, let me go from here. Great. So um, if uh, the ridiculous animated gift from earlier uh, was not clear <laughs> enough, my name is Eric Matisoff and my role at Adobe is as the principal evangelist for analytics and data science, which means my, one of my favorite parts of my job is working with customers like yourselves to make sure you're uh, getting the most out of the products that you can, that you've got a good feel for best practices, tips and tricks, like both Jeff and Jennifer shared today. Um, you're aware of the latest and greatest when it comes to Adobe Analytics and um, the Experience Cloud in general, in terms of integrations, capabilities, what's coming next, what has been around since the, you know, Omniture days and everything in between. And um, you may also be aware that um, I like to try to share content whenever I can through either Experience League or a YouTube channel or Twitter, or Measure Slack, whatever. Um, and we have been working with Kelsey and Kelsey's broader team as well to, um, uh, and, and Sarah Owens also on the uh, Analytics Champ side of things to help kind of grow the opportunity for customers like yourselves to share content and create content of your own and, and for us on the Adobe side to help boost the awareness of all of that. So um, if you have content that you want to contribute, whether it's through these uh, user groups, just like Jeff and Jennifer did today, it sounds like they've already made this request to you. So reach out to them for user group sessions. But if you want to get involved with Experience League the or webinars or the Skill Exchange or um, the YouTube channel or something totally new that you just had an idea about, don't hesitate to reach out to me and we will uh, figure out the best way to make it happen. So um, for today, I have really two topics for you, and I think I'll be able to, to hammer them both out in about a half hour. And uh, unfortunately, I missed the memo on making sure that we are uh, that we are movie related during this session. So just feel free to, as I'm presenting, think of your absolute favorite movie ever. Um, you know, in my top ten, I probably have fifty movies, and um, just you know, come up with some cool ways to apply uh, the stuff that I'm sharing to them. So the two topics that I have for you are number one, talking about the uh, topic that is on so many people's mind right now around cookie lists 
the death of third-party cookies, the shrinking of the value of first-party cookies on in some browsers and on some devices, um, and the strategy that Adobe has defined for um, for that cookieless, you know, future and cookieless existence that we're all living in right now. The other topic that I have for you is um, a little bit of a glimpse into the Adobe Analytics roadmap, which I think will be kind of fun for us. Um, it's something that you know we generally keep kind of close to the vest, but thought that you know for for a kickoff for the uh, North America East user group, it could be a fun thing to share. And um, I'll be happy to stick around with y'all and answer some questions along the way. Um, I don't think I can see the chat pod, so um, Jeff and Jennifer, if there are any specific questions, don't hesitate to unmute yourselves, interrupt me ask questions, I'd much rather hear that the attendees are getting value than the sound of my own voice. We got it covered. Cool, awesome, thank you both. All right, so let's start with the less exciting, though certainly interesting topic of what marketing in a cookie-less world means. And the first thing that I'll say, and since we're on slide one of this section and of my presentation, I'll point out that I kind of hate that term cookie-less because all cookies are not going away. Um, I much prefer the term less cookied, but for whatever reason, the industry, you know, largely driven by my employer, but also tons and tons of other uh, vendors as well. Um, the word cookieless is here to stay and has stuck. And the reason that I don't really love that term cookieless, I much prefer less cookied, is because there's lots of different types of cookies. And um, cookies are actually pretty valuable fundamental pieces of the internet and the way that, you know, that the internet works and is functional uh, beyond just simply analytics tracking and advertising, um, retargeting and all of that kind of fun stuff. So um, if you're not familiar with what a cookie is, don't worry. Um, I'll give you a quick review of it right now and as well as a couple of different types of cookies along the way. Um, my preferred type of cookie would be chocolate chip, but um, when we're talking analytics and advertising, then we are talking either first or third party cookies. Now there's some different types within those that we'll get into a little bit later as we talk about some of the technologies that Adobe is building to help um, support you on your uh, migration to this world of less cookies. But what a cookie simply is, is just a small little text file, just a little line of code that has an expiration and has a domain assigned to it that defines where that cookie was set from. Now, if a cookie is set on the domain, uh, set by the domain that you're currently visiting, you know, you're on adobe.com and we set a first party, we set a cookie um, for adobe.com as the domain, then that's a first party cookie. Or if you're on um, Jeff's, you know, Parents Theater website, and the domain is Jeff's Parents Theaters website.com, then you'll know that's a first party cookie. However, if you're on Adobe.com and a cookie is set for Facebook.com or DoubleClick.com or a different advertiser, then that is called a third party cookie. So really, really simple concept is does the domain that's in your browser address bar match the domain in the cookie? If so, then it's a first party cookie. If not, third party. Now, um, there's a few reasons that third party cookies exist from an advertising and analytics perspective and tracking. First party cookies are super valuable, again, as I mentioned, for just simply making the internet work the way that it should. Um, when cookies were first in, you know, prior to cookies existing, if um, you're on a page and you log in on that page, then you go to the next page, there would be no way that page B would know that on page A you'd already logged in because there wasn't a, any concept of persistence ensuring that, okay, on page B, this user is still logged in because they logged in on page A. And so that is just one of the simple values that, that cookies bring to us these days. Now, from a third-party cookie perspective, that helps enable things like cross domain and cross-party tracking. So, you know, if you've got a.com and b.com, but they're both sending data and, and that's merged together through a third-party cookie, then you're able to do that, um, as well as programmatic advertising, measurement, all sorts of fun things. 
Um, but the truth of the matter is, um, those third party cookies are fading away. They're fading away a little bit slower than we all anticipated they would be. It was um, some time ago that, that Google made the announcement that third party cookies would go away in 2022, which was recently pushed back to late 2023. Um, but along the way, other browsers besides Google Chrome have already put the death kill into, um, into third party cookies. Uh, Firefox, no third party cookies by default, Microsoft Edge, um, Safari, um, and Brave, and I'm sure tons of others that I've never even heard of. Um, so third party cookies are, you know, still around for the vast majority of users because they're on Chrome, though, of course, they can be blocked um, with a simple setting there as well. In addition, there have been changes to first party cookies um, within the Apple ecosystem, and we'll get into those in a little bit. But what's particularly interesting is, you know, third party cookies in general, they weren't all that effective in the first place. Um, we saw tons of issues along the way. We saw um, in a ridiculous increase in terms of media waste, that there was an overstatement of reach because of the inaccuracy of third party cookies. Um, there was also some significant demographics issues along the way with third party cookies because they were so expansive that they were pulling data from like a hundred different places. I remember, you know, when I first heard about DMPs and, and being able to look your own cookie up in a DMP, you could do that. And mine, rec mine um, would tell me that they were sure that I was a male. They were sure that I was a female. They were sure that I lived in New York and they were sure that I lived in Pennsylvania. Um, so at least two of those are going to be wrong. Um, and so wrong demographics was continuing to be a big problem with third party cookies in the first place. And then of course there were plenty of missed conversions and as they disappear, there needs to be this, um, needs to be a better way to align with customer privacy needs, um, from a legal perspective and, and a consent perspective as well as from a browser technology perspective. And, and the way seems to be quite clear that first party data is going to be driving value. Now, this is a challenge for a ton of brands out there. Not everyone has that super tight one-on-one -on -one relationship that um, you, know, you might have with uh, Netflix or you might have, there you go, trying to get some movie references in there for you, Jeff. So, um, or, uh, you know, brands that you're extremely loyal to and you're always logged in for, there are tons of brands out there that have, you know, 10% or less of their customers are currently logged in at any moment in time. In fact, you know, it's, it's not unusual for me to be talking to brands that have one or two or 3% of their visits are logged in visits. Um, however, there's a really nice value exchange opportunity here in terms of data transparency, trust and permission. Um, the data is more accurate and the customer is able to, or the consumer is able to more accurately um, and proactively consent to the use of data, much like you know, the, the folks out in Europe defined in GDPR years ago. And so um, for marketers today, this is kind of what the cookie-based infrastructure looks like. You've got device-based analytics, you augment that data with DMPs or second-party data, third-party data, you then personalize it and retarget, and you're able to attribute your data to that. But as cookies go away, especially those third-party cookies, then a change needs to occur with this specific workflow. And so that's where we get into that first-party data-driven set of analysis and personalization and journey building and advertising. And so on the left here in blue and sort of like a, I don't know what you would even call that color, like a blue green kind of an aqua color uh, in the in the left there. Um, you Me? <laughs> cyan, yes, thank you. Um, you know, I was just talking with, with some customers that sell a lot of printer ink and uh, they would have been disappointed that I didn't come up with the word cyan there. Um, and so, so on the left, you start, first of all, with the omnichannel analytics platforms that you're using today or are looking to grow into using further, where you can identify the paths that users take 
prior to authenticating? Are you are there specific conversions or micro conversions along the way? Certain pieces of content, certain um, levels of uh, uh, engagement or videos that that those users watch that end up convincing them, you know what, actually, this is a brand I trust, and I'm interested in sharing my first party uh, data to them in order to receive more value from the brands. And speaking of that value, that's, that's a huge piece of that one to one relationship that um, Adobe customers need to be thinking about with your consumers and prospects of um, you know, the, the Adobe customer is receiving um, valuable information, but what, where's the value exchange in terms of why the consumer would actually be willing to say, you know what, here's my email address. I would love to subscribe to your newsletter or be informed of when this product is back in stock or to um, hear more information about what's coming next within your company. And so, you, so you're able to take the analyses that you've performed in terms of identifying those paths that lead to authentication and registration, and then utilize that data to personalize the experiences based on those insights. So, you know, users that, I don't know, see, watch a video for more than 45 seconds, or have uh, read more than four types of content, or have come from this specific marketing campaign um, and are on that type of device all sorts of different ways to mix and match the dimensions and your segments that you have within analysis workspace in order to then personalize the experience to trigger the authentication request at the right moment for that particular user. And I'll tell you what, it's not easy. Um, that's gonna take work, it's gonna take time. And, and what we've recognized is that more and more customers aren't just focused on revenue and ROI, within their analyses, but also adding conversion, adding authentications and registrations and logins as no longer a micro conversion, but a true KPI that they focus on and have goals for and drive um, and, and aim for increased um, uh, conversions of. So then we get into the right-hand side where once that first party data has been collected, you want to utilize an identity-based system that can merge um, whatever types of identity namespaces you throw at it, whether it be email or phone number or loyalty ID, CRM ID, whatever in the moment um, piece of first-party data that you're able to collect, you want to build that into an identity graph that you can then orchestrate journeys for across mobile app and push notifications and email and on-site uh, uh, personalizations, as well as, of course, for uh, first party driven advertising through customer data platforms that are based on first party data, all of those kind of fun things. And then that's where you get to this cycle of um, I'm, I, as a brand, you are um, identifying the paths that users I th authenticate on, personalizing those experiences, and then delivering better journeys and delivering on that value that you promised to them. That, that happen to drive that consent. Now that's a lot of information and it's a significant um, transition for virtually every single customer out there. There's a few, like a handful of Adobe customers that were already thinking about this prior to the you know, word cookie list becoming a buzzword. And um, the rest of us are all sort of playing catch up. And we thought that this strategy would be a really helpful way to kind of frame your mind in terms of how we need to be thinking about migration of, um, of, our, of our less cookied future. Now, the question that we get all the time is, what about Apple's intelligent tracking prevention or ITP, you've probably heard it talked about. There's a number of folks that are doing all sorts of great research at Adobe and at Adobe partners around um, the uh, limitations that are being driven by the Apple ecosystem, whether it be you know, on iPhones or iPads or MacBooks or in uh, Safari or on iOS and other browsers, literally any browser on iOS, for example. What we've recognized is um, Apple is starting to even crumble the cookies of first party cookies as well. 
Um, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through what those changes are, but just to give you a feel for, and we're gonna get nice and technical here. There's, there's nothing anyone loves more than uh, getting to see a, a kind of silly workflow like this, but I think it does a really good job of explaining how things work today. Um, so in the bottom left here, you'll see, oh, I have a mouse. Um, in the bottom left here, you'll see the device, the laptop, the phone, et cetera. And um, when the web SDK is called to the Experience Edge Network, or if you're um, not migrated yet to the web SDK, anything is called, um, the um, Edge Network makes a request to the Experience Cloud ID service where it returns a value that is stored in a first party cookie. And that ECID is shared to all the Adobe applications that you care about. But um, there's, there's some fun changes that are happening there. So all iOS 14 plus browsers, as I mentioned, plus Safari on Big Sur and beyond um, are dealing with each of these different kind of limitations when it comes to cookie expiration. First of all, third-party cookies, totally dead. Um, then there's some unique um, instances where first-party cookies could even be limited to just 24 hours, which means if a user is on your site on Monday and they come back on Wednesday, if they, um, came from an advertising technology like Facebook or Google, et cetera, and there's an advertising query parameter, then they would look like a totally new user on uh, Wednesday. Um, if without that, then it's seven days. We're, we're going from two years down to seven days, which is a pretty significant change on, on those devices. And so what we noticed along the way is Apple is making it very clear and, and we actually work with the Safari browser team and, and the ITP team that um, if cookies are set server side without a CNAME, C name, then there's a there's like five different ways to explain that type of cookie, then Safari isn't really setting a limit on the length of expiration there. Um, and so that's where we're looking to say, you know what, if you're able to set the Experience Cloud ID service today, then on day one, your value may be one, two, three, four. You come back seven days later, it's something completely different. And there's no way to see that that's the same user. Um, however, if we're able to set that ECID value in a cookie that is set server side through a DNS A record or HTTP response header, all sorts of fun things, then we're able to see it's the same person on that browser um, for multiple days. And so I'm really excited about where we are taking this. So we're currently um, building this technology as we speak. So I promised that you get a feel for the roadmap and this is just the, one of the first items. But um, what customers will be doing is deriving their own customer device ID server side and setting that in a server side cookie that then the device passes along with the ID to the edge network. And then that will pass it along on over to each of the different applications from Adobe. Now there's one caveat to be aware of is um, I did not by accident put the word web SDK in here. So the, um, the initial implementation of the customer device ID is going to require a migration to web SDK. So keep that in mind as you're you know, planning your next four, six, eight, 10 months of implementation plans. The really exciting thing for our um, timeline is that beta is planning to start this month for the bringing of your own ID and general availability in October of this year. Okay, that was a ton of information. Before I migrate into our next topic, Jeff and Jennifer, is there anything that I went way too fast on that there were questions about that I could jump back in before we switch topics completely? Well. I didn't see any specific questions about this. However, we have several users, including myself, who are only getting about half the size uh, on the slides. So we're not sure if it, this is a bandwidth uh, like oh, no. scaling or if you can stop sharing the screen and start again. Hopefully they'll return it to big for everyone to see. Yeah, that doesn't sound fun. Oh, Lord, Let's, Yeah. You want me to just start from the beginning? One more time. We're feeling, we're feeling this time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is that any better this way? 
Not for me. I'm still only getting about half the visible screen. It may be just, I don't know what, what is happening. Maybe. Auto scale. Like Jeff's presentation was full screen. I don't know what was with mine. Like if mine was full screen or not, because I'm I don't know. Although, I mean, it could come down to system differences too. He's on a Mac. Are you on a PC? I'm on a PC. I'm on a PC. That might be the difference. I have no idea. I mean, there's so many variables. I don't know. Huh. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So, so right now you're you're not seeing the full slide. We're no. seeing the full slide. It's just taking up about yeah. half the real estate in our screens as uh, what was showing earlier. So that's yeah. oh, I see. huge black borders around your slide. So oh. um, now everyone who's not on a camera can like lean in and squint. I, I kind of can't. So it's it's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have. I have one idea. Let me switch my resolution to a PC friendly one. Oh, that. Oh, maybe that's it. Okay. And so we do so the ratio is as well. So I'll let you try that first and then I will. Let me give it a shot. All right. Let's give that a. Uh, wait, did that work? Yeah, it's all you Mac people with your retina displays. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's see. This makes it any. Okay, sorry for uh, the delay here. No worries. Right, let's see if this works any better. Looks like we do have a couple of questions coming in. We'll try and. Take care of them. Yep. Nope. Nope. We're just no. we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna we're huh. gonna sal uh, sally forth and move so on. strange. All right, sorry about that. Folks. Okay. It's okay. Um, That's okay. Uh, do we wanna do the the one question that came in, Jeff? Sure, first? let's go ahead and do the one question. You wanna okay. go? Uh, regarding migrating to the Adobe ADK, do you recommend that a client always works with a consultant? It seems there is a lot that goes into the migration. Or is there a beginning to, uh, oh, ah, it's moving on me, sorry. <laughs> or is there a beginning to end steps to migrate? Uh, we have started looking into this and have set up test environments that use the SDK. However, we have several tickets open with customer care to help us with this and Target is still not working. Huh, yeah, that does not sound like a fun experience. Um, the, um, the web SDK, I would say, you shouldn't have to work with a consultant to get it up and running. Um, the, um, you know, working with someone that has experience with it is always a plus. Um, but in terms of client care tickets and target not running, then that is definitely a little surprising, especially since it should really all just kind of work seamlessly. If you've got the, the tag firing at the top and you've got the pre hiding script and um, it should be relatively painless. So definitely sounds like something funky is going on there. Um, Damon, if you'd like, feel free to reach out to me and and I'll I'll follow up on um, those tickets and see if there's anything I can help with as well. But from like a consultative perspective, generally, you know, it sounds like the way that you're you're going about it, um, testing before actually um, but before pushing it live is is a no brainer. Um, and that should get you the experience that you need to actually get it working. So um, sorry that you're having that trouble there. Okay. <laughs> David <laughs> said contact information. <laughs> I'll send it to you directly, Damon. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, is there a way to track the campaigns in bulk uh, if you did not know the ID number? That one to me or in general? Uh, go, go, go start, start Jeff, and yeah, in general. <laughs> so if you're talking about an ID number, um, maybe you can expand that. Well, I was going to ask you to expand on that a little bit. When you're saying tracking them in bulk, 
Uh, so when we do uh, some of our campaigns, we try and do something with, within like one one identifier within the string so that you can like, you know, tree them up. Remember, uh, you have marketing channels, you have the ability to create processing rules, you have classifications, you have any number of ways of manipulating the data as it's coming through for your campaign tracking codes. So if you don't know the exact ID, um, so I might have to get a little bit more of a clarification on that, but that's kind of the approach that we take. Yeah, it also really depends on what, what team using Jeff's terminology, you have actually decided and what formatting and, and, and structures your organization has decided for, for your, your campaigns because, <laughs> oh, we have somebody crashing, crashing the meeting. Uh. Oh, um, because, you know, depending on how you've set it up, I mean, for, for me, I don't necessarily know what campaigns the, the marketers are using. I will often just go into workspace and I'll do a breakdown and say, okay, here's your top 10, here's your top 25, here's your top whatever. Um, if they're looking for something specific, then they tell me what they're looking for and say, okay, I need a report for campaign X or campaign Y, uh, mostly because I can't stay on top of everything that they're doing. So there's lots of different little ways that, that you can sort of watch for it, but um, I think we need more details about how you've structured your campaigns in order to really help facilitate um, this. Yeah, there's definitely some front, front end planning on that. And then uh, there's also the communication with the different teams. I know that it's very difficult, especially when you've got a larger uh, set of people that are bringing in campaign tracking codes. So if, if there might be some general searches that you might have to do, it just depends. Again, classification can be your friend. So really kind of take, you might want to take that approach. And then the other thing is if you have a standard that you're trying to st stick to, that's the other thing. So I'm going to pound that one home. <laughs> standard, standard, standards. Yeah. So. <laughs> and actually based on your, your second qualification, like you're, you're doing overall analysis, you don't know all the groups that do the campaign. Sounds very similar to what I handle. Um, again, if, if your data is well-formed or at least mostly well-formed, you can use segments to say, okay, if it's coming from this source, and these campaigns, this source, those campaigns, you could do combinations and just do breakdowns in your workspace to show your top 25 or, or like we can go up to top 400. I don't know how many you're using or how big your reports are, but you can do breakdown analysis rather than trying to pull out specifics. And then you can use segmentation to break them based on qualifiers from your different um, types of, you know, your source, your channel, your term, your content, whatever whatever actual classifications um, or qualifications, I should say, you're using, you can build that all together with your classifications, with your marketing channels, and just with general segmentation to try and get an overall picture of, of what you're trying to pull. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of also, you know, breaking, if, if you've got some unknown campaign IDs, then you can break it down by the refer, the referring domain to try to learn a little bit of, about it. And then yeah. you at least might be able to discover who the right team is to annoy to say like, hey, you have to actually learn to communicate and tell me what are the, what does this random alphanumeric code actually mean? Um, the other thing that I really like to do is um, set up alerts that alert me to any, um, any visits where the tracking code is populated, but the classification is not set for them. Um, so you can kind of like create an alert based on unspecified for your classification. And then that way you're just, you automatically know, oh, okay, all right, there's a problem I need to go solve. And um, that's, that's something I like doing with classifications in general is mm -hmm. like trying to find, trying to use alerts to proactively let me know like, uh oh, there's something I need to classify, and I totally didn't know it was even going to be captured. Yes. Yeah, that's a good one. And one of the other way, approaches that I actually had to use when to, uh, was also using the the uh, you said refer, also your previous URL as well. You can go after that that value, take a look at your previous URL, see where it actually came from. Um, uh, we've had to perform perform that exact analysis a couple of times to figure out where in the world it's coming from. So those are a couple of your options you have there as well. So thanks for kind of jogging my memory there, Eric. <laughs> course anytime i think it was my dog howard that really did the 
the memory gap. <laughs> there you go. What else? Do we have any more questions before we uh, we need to wrap up? I thought I thought we might have had another one earlier. I think, although I think we got that one answered already. Yes, we did. Yeah, I was trying to stay on top of some of the small questions as they were coming in as I I could. Well, if there's not anything else coming through, I think we're going to call this a day. <laughs> and again. Oh, thank yes. you, Damon. Yes, uh, thank you for coming. Yeah, yeah thank you. We want to thank everybody for coming, uh, Eric and Kelsey. And uh, of course, I want to say thank you to Jennifer as well. Um, but um, thank you all for coming to this. This is our big all, big kickoff. So now uh, we have moving forward. Again, we're looking for presenters. We're looking for people that are wanting to do things uh, with us uh, and and speak because there's so much out there for us to talk about. That's Adobe Analytics. We this is the job that we do every single day. So uh, there's so much that we definitely want to you know talk about. Uh, the idea is to make this more of an open forum when we can. So if you can come in and we can just literally talk about stuff, that's what we'd like to do. So please. Contact us, you know, get, get a, a hold of us through the, through the chapter. We will do what we can. Uh, we saw some people that uh, had expressed interest in being a featured presenter or a featured attendee. If that's true, if you really want to be a featured attendee in the future, let us know. Um, Jen, do you have any final words? Uh, no, but it uh, looks like uh, somebody is uh, nominating um, Eric's puppy for, for being a presenter next time. <laughs> <laughs> he, he loves merchandising e bars, don't you? Yes, it looks like he does. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, All right. thank you very much, everybody. I'm sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much, and uh, and have a great afternoon and a great week. You great. too. Thanks, y'all. Bye. All righty. Thank you. Bye.